I'm Julia Imoyemarsan, the Director for Strategy and Partnership at AREA. And today we are here for our fifth episode of the AREA MSME Talks. Uh, this episode uh, is concluding the first half of the series. And uh, we want to talk uh, about sustainability issues and ASEAN MSMEs. Sustainable development was already an important topic globally in ASEAN. Everybody knows about it. Uh, but it's gaining even more attention now that people are discussing about uh, the new normal, the post-pandemic uh, recovery. It is also a topic uh, for which we received many requests from participants of this webinar series when we started uh, the series. So we are particularly happy to have finally the chance to discuss uh, about uh, this topic with uh, our four distinguished speakers that I thank for being with us and I will introduce in a minute and with all participants that are connecting with us today. Let me remind you to please keep your microphone muted throughout the webinar, but feel free to interact with us uh, with the chat. Uh, give us ideas, comments, and also uh, questions for the speakers, because we will get back to those uh, towards the end of the webinar during the Q&A session uh, that the TJ will be moderating uh, uh, later on. Uh, but to go back to the topic, um, again, I mean, it's a topic that uh, is uh, being increasingly discussed and also at area, especially our colleagues from uh, the energy department have been working extensively on uh, uh, for a number of years. And we will hear more about this uh, uh, in a minute. At ASAN level and also globally, there's also increasing recognition and attention about the fact that uh, a broad range of actors and stakeholders uh, are and can join efforts for a more sustainable future. And the business sector has a very important role to play. For instance, the other day I was reading about how Gojek is launching its carbon offsetting service where customers can compensate travel CO2 emissions. And this is just one example among many. So today we are here to discuss specifically about the role that the MSMEs in ASEAN can play for this uh, uh, transition. And we are very happy to do so with the four speakers. Uh, we have the privilege to have with us uh, Ms. Yvonne Chong, who is the founder and managing director of Brown Bag Wines in Singapore. Yvonne founded Brown Bag Wines in 2017, and she's a minimal intervention wine entrepreneur who aims to serve clean and expressive wines to a community of organic, biodynamic wine drinkers and growers. And before becoming an entrepreneur, Yvonne spent more than a decade in the advertising industry, managing several major accounts locally and globally. Thank you very much, Yvonne, for being with us. We also have the pleasure to have with us uh, Ms. Priyanka Chetri, who is the CEO of Grosserdel in Cambodia. Um, she founded Grosserdel in August 2019. Uh, it is an online grocery store that provides plastic-free delivery of the guaranteed fresh local food, uh, Cambodian made brands and wholesale products. She believes in promoting sustainable agriculture and the company grew out of the need to connect local small scale farmers to consumers seeking their products. Uh, before becoming an entrepreneur, uh, Priyanka had a career in banking where she learned how to manage a team, design the right operation and also bringing a project from start to profit. Uh, thank you very much, Priyanka, for being with us. It's also a great pleasure to have with us Professor Jotai Kim, who is professor from the Department of Business Administration uh, at Dankook University in Korea. He has been involved in many research projects focusing on green growth and sustainability since 2010. And Professor Kim holds a PhD in International Business Strategy from the Seoul National University. He was the president of the Academy of International Businesses in Korea and also a senior researcher in the International Business Research Center at Seoul National University. And he was also a businessman because uh, he had worked uh, for Samsung Electronics from 1991 to 1996. Thank you again, Professor Kim, for being one of our speakers today. And also, uh, it's a great pleasure to have with us uh, my colleague uh, from AREA, Dr. Venkata Chalam Ambumosi, uh, Dr. Ambu, uh, as we will call him throughout the webinar. 
He's a senior economist at Elia with over 20 years of experience in economic and environmental policy making, besides research interest in a range of sustainability issues from climate change to clean energy, the circular economy, regional cooperation, and much more. He has worked with the Asian Development Bank Institute, the University of Tokyo, and the Institute for Global Environmental Strategy. He published several books, research articles, many research, uh, many project reports on renewable energy policies, sustainable infrastructure design, the private sector participation in green growth. He was also a member of the APEC expert panel on green finance, the G20 task force on low carbon infrastructure, and the ASEAN working group on climate resilient growth. And he obtained his PhD from the University of Tokyo. Thank you very much, Dr. Ambu. So we can immediately start uh, the conversation now. Uh, and uh, I would invite uh, uh, our two entrepreneurs, our two MSME speakers, to start with a brief introduction uh, on their businesses and to tell us a little bit how sustainability practices are an integral part uh, of their business model. And also to share some perspective about how the effect of the pandemic uh, impacted uh, uh, their sustainability efforts. And let's start this round with uh, Yvonne. So Yvonne, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you. Can, can you hear me clearly? Yes. Yeah? yeah. Um, so basically, I, you know, we market uh, minimal intervention wines out of Singapore. Um, and we work with growers from you know, various parts of the world. And when we look at launching the business back in 2017, um, it was a conscious decision to create a business model that is sustainable, uh, which then helps us to define how we would operate and the various key pillars that would uh, form the business uh, you know, as a whole. So if, if I were to kind of break it down very simply, um, the three key pillars that we operate on are you know, logistics, which forms a huge part of what we do because we're solely an e-commerce based uh, company. The second one is obviously our business model. And the third one would be our products and services because we are in a, in a business of wine. So, um, and, and by defining that area of you know, sustainability, um, it was a very calculated uh, conscious decision that we have to make in terms of every single you know, processes, decisions, partnerships, uh, audiences that we reach out to and who would be attracted to us at the end of the day. Um, and, and that defined us as a brand. And it was quite interesting because during the pandemic, um, it, was, it was interesting enough to see what came out of the pandemic because obviously there were a lot more conversations about going, you know, the way people or consumers going back to the basics, you know, growing your own vegetables and, you know, consuming healthily and consuming what you need. So all the conversations started to go back to the basics. I mean, granted, wine is somewhat still a luxury item, but I think the whole idea about consumers practicing a sustainable approach, sustainable lifestyle, um, and a holistic one, um, that helped us to be in the same, I would say, you know, kind of in the same belief philosophy, same realm uh, as, as where the market or the trend is headed, uh, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, and I, I would say very simply, you know, without going into the key components of the pillars, uh, that is how, you know, we are as a sustainable business. Thank you very much, Yvonne. Uh, uh, you concluded your remarks, right? Yeah, and I, I mean, I, I hope the, I answered the question. I kind of gave a very, you know, holistic view because otherwise it can go into a very thorough, because each piece, it's a lot to unpack. And in, in a short frame of time, it's, so yeah, I thought it just go concise and precise. Perfect, very much spot on. So we can immediately get the second point of view from our entrepreneurs. So Priyanka, please, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hi, uh, good afternoon, everybody. 
Uh, I, my name is Priyanka. I am the CEO and founder of Grossadel. So Grossadel, let me give you a brief introduction. Grossadel basically is an e-commerce platform where we deliver our services to. We deal with the local fresh products. We deliver the products right at the doorstep of the consumer. Our company, which grew out in the need to connect the local farmers, the local producers of Cambodia to the right consumer who was seeking their products. Uh, if you look into the current world, looking into the traffic and everything, everything, I'm speaking before the pandemic, because when both the family members go out for shopping, uh, go out for work, and to gather the groceries was a difficult task. So to mitigate that, we started Grossadel. And also, we started Grossadel with three main pillars. The most important pillar in Grossadel, what we advocate always, is sustainability. When we speak about sustainability, we divided it into two parts. One, sustainability towards the environment and sustainability in business. When we say sustainability in the environment is that we do zero plastic delivery, as in we do not deliver any product in plastic. The second thing which we focus to be sustainable business as a startup which is about to complete one year to sustain in a longer run, we had kept our processes and our employee as lean as possible so that we can have a longer future for our company. The second most important pillar, which I can say is made in Cambodia or produce in Cambodia products. So basically we provide a platform to the producers of Cambodia, to the farmers of Cambodia who wanted to sell their product to the right consumer who wants to buy their product. The third most important thing which we always focus is women empowerment. Out of three uh, management team, uh, no, out of four management team which we have, three are women. So we always want to keep a ratio of 70% women staff in our, at Grossadel. So we are trying to focus on that also, trying to promote how we can give an opportunity for the women who can grow up to a leadership level so we can have a fem female-led company. So these are our three pillars. So the other part of the question which you ask about the pandemic, how we had to cope up and what we have seen is that in Grossadel, I can definitely say that due to the pandemic, we have seen a skyrocket increase in our order. We slept one night and the other night when we woke up, the orders were like overwhelming. So we had when the orders came in, we deal with groceries and fresh products. That means somebody is waiting at their house to get the groceries, right? So we had to fulfill the product. As I said earlier, as we wanted our business to be sustainable, we, were, we are happy to say that we always try to cross-train our staff. So when we started in the month of August last year, we started cross-training our staff to do the groundwork also. So when we saw the overnight increase of the orders, we were able to fulfill all the orders until and unless we hired other staff. So this is the overall which we had due to the pandemic, I can say, but later on we hired staff and we became neutral and still the journey is going on. I think that's it, what I can say as of now. Thank you very much, Priyanka. Very interesting uh, developments. And now immediately let's get the point of view of our experts and let's travel virtually uh, to Korea uh, to discuss with Professor Kim. Uh, Professor Kim, you have worked extensively on these issues of sustainability in Korea. And uh, so what trends have you observed in your country? And also, what lessons can you share for ASEAN MSMEs? Professor Kim, the floor is yours. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, so um, let, let me share uh, some Korean story and experience uh, in SME and uh, sustainability. So first, uh, I, I will explain the economic structure of Korea. Uh, so Korea uh, started uh, economic development development uh, in 1960s, so more than 50 years ago. Uh, but uh, after uh, 
more than 50 years uh, effort, uh, Korea achieved a very uh, successful development. So now uh, the economy is quite good and we have some uh, very famous and competitive uh, companies in the world. Uh, but uh, during the economic development, there are three uh, characteristics. The first one is the development was led by the government. So government planned everything and uh, every uh, industry policy and every strategy. It, it's, a, uh, it's a model of actually Japanese model. As you know, Korea uh, learned many things from Japan. And second uh, uh, characteristic is uh, uh, the uh, economic development was uh, uh, led by la large companies. So after government uh, uh, planned uh, many things, uh, Korean large companies uh, played entrepreneurial effort. So now they became be become the very uh, global companies. The examples are Samsung, LG, Hyundai, yeah? uh, something like that. But during this process, actually, uh, this may be the uh, similar in most Asian countries. The role of the SME or MSME was uh, quite uh, small. So the uh, so we say economic concentration. The most uh, the, of the production and economic activity and wealth ownership are concentrated on uh, large companies and Korean jobs. So. <laughs> Uh, SMEs are so far a kind of uh, ignorant area. But now, now Korea is very strongly realizing that we must develop uh, globally competitive and excellent uh, SMEs. So they are uh, developing uh, many pol policies. Uh, but uh, we want to learn from Germany or uh, Japan. So, you know, hidden champion. Hidden champion means uh, globally competent SMEs in Germ Germany. So this is the Korean situation. So in sustainability or green growth, it's uh, uh, quite, quite similar. So uh, this is the history, uh, I, I will speed up. This is the history of the green growth in Korea. Uh, around 10 years ago, uh, around 2010, there was a first uh, policy effort uh, of the Korean government. And now, uh, actually two, two months ago, the current uh, president announced the Green New Deal. Uh, so it's uh, the second effort. So in the first uh, attempt of green growth, uh, SMEs were also ignored. But uh, at this time, uh, Oh, it, it times up. So, anyway, the role role of I, I, I will I will let, let me finish within thirty minutes. Thirty minutes. So, the simply the role of uh, SME is very limited in Korea. But one example is a green growth partnership. Green growth partnership. This is a partnership with the large enterprise. So, the uh, we want they want to share. Uh, resources and capabilities of large enterprise in green management uh, with SMEs. So it's a, a very recent uh, attempt in Korea, green growth partnership. So I want to uh, introduce this concept. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, very interesting uh, story uh, from your country. Uh, now let's uh, uh, go back to area uh, with uh, Dr. Ambu. So, Dr. Mambu, you have worked extensively on the circular economy and for industrial revolution technologies. So, from this research, what lessons can you share with us uh, to make businesses, and particularly MSMEs, more environmentally sustainable? Dr. Ambu, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Gulia, and uh, uh, good afternoon, my colleagues. And uh, uh, when we say SMEs and uh, uh, the, we need to understand the characteristics, particularly when coming to this uh, developing Asia. And this uh, SMEs is a part of the socioeconomic fabric. 
we need we should uh, understand it and from that perspective and we can broadly classify these smes into three broader categories one is the uh, smes uh, that is operating within the clusters second thing is smes along the global chain and third one is smes that is uh, uh, supporting or serving the domestic market so the sustainability imperative of these three categories of SMEs differ widely. And uh, the imperative is that is the, they need to contribute for the job market. And uh, currently they employ about 90% uh, of the employment in the, in the urban and the rural areas. Second thing is they need to contribute for the local environmental sustainability, like improved air quality and the water quality. Here, this is the importance of the circular economy comes in. And um, the circular economy is a kind of a new business model for the SMEs uh, to transform their uh, linear production, like uh, consumption and the dumping, the waste production, into a kind of industrial symbiosis. For example, if you are operating in a cluster and um, uh, an output or the waste from one farm could be a kind of input for the other farm. So this is what we, uh, frankly saying that is a kind of a very basic operational principles of the circular economy. By transforming into linear to the circular and uh, uh, SM is gain. Where that gains comes from, one is uh, avoiding this uh, risk uh, from the resource. And second thing is to bring the competitiveness. You are producing, you are maximizing your profit with uh, minimum input. Here I can say that is uh, there are uh, several examples exist and, and in our study uh, one thing one I can say that is that I'm living in the Jakarta city and if you go in the peri-urban area nearly we have a industrial clusters uh, there's more textile clusters in the, in the Bandung and uh, in the Bohor area nearly here 30 percent of the solid waste has been uh, dumped in the or it has been incinerated or it goes to the landfills so we find by by making a circular loop by resource sharing. And uh, here we find that is the uh, resource efficiency can be improved at the individual farm level, as well as the cluster level that also uh, produces uh, better air quality and the water quality, as well as they reduce the carbon dioxide. If this waste is transformed into energy streams. So I, I say now two examples, that is how this is works. There is a remote uh, place called uh, Maniwa. This is a small wood industry cluster in Japan. In, uh, it is like any other country, like, like Indonesia, the Philippines, uh, the cluster is same, the characters is same. Uh, there is a depletion of the resources. That is, uh, people are moving from that uh, uh, area to this urban area like nearby um, Osaka. And there are about 50 SMEs there operating in that cluster. Here, the waste creation is a kind of a challenge. And they, they basically, they, they uh, incinerate the waste. Then the government of Japan has introduced a bill where they no longer cannot incinerate this. They, they cannot burn the wastes. So they need to find that innovative ways of uh, using these resources. There are two companies they came in, and they transformed this waste into a kind of new products. Like, like a bricks that is made up of the wood, uh, wooden product or the biofuels. Another is the steam that is used to, um, for, for, for farming purposes. So here we found this by um, being innovative and uh, uh, this, this, there are new job creation that is uh, we found and there are uh, about seven small SMEs, particularly more, more, more green SMEs as uh, brought out. So this also helped uh, this uh, cluster to become a kind of uh, eco-friendly cluster or the geo emission cluster. So similar uh, examples exist. For example, uh, there is an example where how this IoT technologies could be introduced. Uh, it happens in the cluster in the uh, Bangalore and um, where this uh, Kind of a platform, digital platform is established where they each each SME could be able to share their resource inventory, the waste generation, 
and also where the demand lies. So these problems, uh, this kind of platforms, creation of the digital platforms and sharing that information helped this SME cluster become much more resource efficient. And we estimated that is about, there are 15% reduction in the waste generation as well as the improved quality that is coming from this uh, clusters. So those, these clusters could be upscaled and it could be multiplied for the other settings. So I stop here and we'll come back to you later. Thank you very much. Extremely interesting, Dr. Ambu. So let's continue our conversation and now let's start uh, our second round. And again, let's start with our entrepreneurs. Uh, I would ask to both of you to share your thoughts about the business practicality of adapting and implementing sustainability practices. And also to, you already did it a little bit, but to continue sharing some views uh, with us about how you, how you see this trend moving especially in the post-pandemic phase. And this time, let's start with uh, Priyanka. So Priyanka, the floor is yours. Thank you. I think uh, with the limited amount of experience which I have until date, I can definitely say from Grossadel's point of view is that including sustainability-focused product was an early supplier effort for Grossadel. And also for our initial order, we knew that we wanted a zero plastic delivery. So our goals for incorporating more eco adoption into our process are ongoing. The practicality of incorporating sustainability into our business has been a model fairly seamlessly for us, likely because it is never a question for us, uh, like uh, will we do it or will we not do it? That is what we focus primarily that yes, we will incorporate that and we will advocate those practices as a part of our brand. So we will continue to do and incorporate those in our supply chain. To emphasize more, to create the awareness, awareness in our staff or be it our customers who are there right now, uh, I, can, I would like to give you an example. For example, when we say that we uh, deliver our products without plastic, that means we use reusable bags. So when the products comes to the packing team, we have the packing team who packs the product in a reusable bag and then it shifts to the delivery team. In the packing team room, we have a board which states that the number of plastic bags reduced by that particular person on that particular day. That means that it gives a boost to the person also who is packing the product that, okay, on my behalf, like for today, Today, I have reduced 50 uses of plastic bag or 100 uses of plastic bag, which is a kind of boost to them also. Yes, I have contributed my bit towards the environment. So next, it goes to the delivery team. When a delivery team does a delivery of 5 to 10 orders in a day, and in a 5 to 10 orders, the person knows that he has reduced 100 plastic bags. So he comes back, check into the board, that gives him also a sense of satisfaction that yes, my bit is there to contribute. So this is how we try to enhance our work. And coming to the consumers, the consumer which we have, we try to promote the sustainable product which we sell it in Grossadel. When I say sustainable product, I would like to give another one example. For example, we were doing a few uh, promotions on uh, like uh, on coconut water. If somebody would like to order a fresh coconut water for a particular month, we used to give a free bamboo straw. That means we are reducing the use of plastic straw from a consumer point of view also and trying to educate the consumer that yes, they can re replace the use of plastic straw by a bamboo straw. So these are a few bits from a customer's point of view, from employee's point of view. The third part I would like to say from a vendor point of view. As I said at the first place that we are trying to provide a platform for the producer of Cambodia. When I say producer of Cambodia, there might be a person who is producing some jams or jelly or kimchi in their own personal space, in their own personal kitchen, and they would like to sell it to a larger audience. But having said that, when they use plastic box, which is not reusable and it goes as a waste, we try to educate them, we try to 
take them through the food safety guidelines and how they can replace the use of plastic box with a glass box or a reusable box, which the customer which intake will return it and the vendor can take it and reuse it. So these are the three steps which we are trying to focus and trying to put uh, sustainability as a whole. So I think the last I would like to conclude is that like every single day we are learning, right? During the pandemic, we just understood that nothing is constant. Everything is changing. The only thing constant is change. So we are trying to focus how new things and how new change are going to come and how we can focus and get adapted towards it. Thank you, Priyanka, for this excellent lesson about how adaptability and innovation is absolutely necessary and now more than ever. Uh, we learned a lot, I think, from your practical experience um, you just shared. So let's immediately move to Yvonne to continue the conversation. Yvonne, the floor is yours. Thank you. I think in, in terms uh, for practicality, for, for us, I think as a business, if anyone is looking to start a business, it's not a function of starting a, you know, a, a, a business just, you know, a sustainable business just because we should be. I think it's important for one to evaluate your audience, your product, because the, there are different groups of, and age groups of audiences where they respond better to sustainability uh, compared to others, at least in our case, from what we have observed. Um, because it's a fine balance between what you can pay and what, you're what you can pay and what you're prepared to pay and versus you know, what is in terms of affordability. Um, because for example, if you go and have a cup of coffee and if it's a fair trade coffee, for example, um, if it's a normal non-fair trade coffee can cost three bucks and for fair trade coffee, it costs 350. You're like, okay, I don't mind. But if it's gonna cost double the price, then it doesn't become practical and affordable for many. So, I think for us, uh, we were very careful uh, to evaluate our business model, who we wanted to target, and it then determined the products, the pricing, the distribution, uh, and, and all that is very important because it then gives us a view whether we can do this, is it practical, is it not practical? Uh, so that's the first piece. Um, I think the second point would be, you know, in terms of trend, I, Personally, you know, don't see it as a trend because I think trend comes across as very short-lived, very transient. Um, I think in our case, when it comes to wines, um, it's a function of giving consumers the option because it doesn't make one wine better than the other. And when I say the other, and I mean this by the classical wines and wines that we have been drinking, you know, a long time ago, and there's nothing wrong, you know, it tastes equally as good. There are minimal intervention wines that are bad. There are also, you know, classical wines that are bad, if, if you know what I'm saying. So it, it, it's not about knocking one another. I think it's about just putting choices uh, for consumers to consider. Uh, the last piece, I think it's why I also don't see it as trend because I think it is important for all individuals, whether it's businesses or private individuals, to adopt some form of sustainability uh, in their lives. Because I think, at least for us, you know, our surrounding is already so fast paced. There's just so much clutter going on and trying to slow down um, and consuming, and this you know, could be information, not just food alone, not just drinks, right? But consuming information in a very slow and very choice uh, manner, I think that's very important. Um, and that's how we approach wine. It's not just a transaction, it's not just a product, but it's about you know, us influencing you know, the, the business, the community, the consumption as a whole and not specific to wine. Yeah, uh, that would be our, our view. Thank you very much, uh, Yvonne, for this second very interesting point of view. Uh, now let's immediately move to uh, Dr. Ambu. Um, so, Another area you are working on is smart cities. Uh, what opportunities exist in your opinion for MSMEs to contribute to the development of smart cities in ASEAN? Mm -hmm. What can you share with us, Dr. Ambu? 
Thank you, Vilia. And it is uh, really a complex. And um, given the sustainability challenges, and these, uh, the cities are going to be the growth engines of uh, economic. In the, in the, in the, in the, for example, and uh, nearly 70% of this uh, GDP is coming from the cities. And, and it will be increasing more and in the, the future. Second, more people are going to be living in the cities. So we, uh, we see this is a smart city initiative from the perspective of uh, what type of sustainability solutions uh, these cities can offer for the countries as well as the SMEs. And as, as a part of the smart city, there is an ASEAN smart city network and we selected about six cities and we are analyzing their key performance uh, indicators. We developed a key performance indicator and we are analyzing what are the sustainable ranking of these cities. And when we say smart city, basically it is the application of these uh, uh, modern technologies uh, to, for the improved service delivery. That could be in the energy sector, that could be in the water sector or the transport sector. And, uh, but here we see that is the smart city is a kind of a entrepreneurial city or it's a kind of uh, organics. It is natural for every city for smart cities. Uh, so what kind of new entrepreneurships that is available for the uh, SMEs? That is, that, is, that is the angle that is we see uh, when, when, when think about the opportunities. From that perspective, there are two opportunities that is exist for the SMEs. One is a type of uh, kind of extended enterprise model that we had seen in many cities in Singapore and Bangkok and also the New York and uh, in Salem city that is we studied. And uh, this uh, entrepreneurship or this extended enterprise model is like this. When we develop a smart city, it is a kind of a improved service delivery with this advanced type of technology. Then we find there are two kind of uh, interlinkages. One is uh, there is uh, some uh, kind of a new SMEs. They are basically technology providers. They contribute for the smart city. Basically they come into the market. Uh, then they also create a kind of a new system or new ecosystem where the data is shared, information shared, that provide the opportunities for the new type of models. That is a new service delivery that could uh, contribute for the further growth of these uh, small and medium enterprises. I'll first I'll say that is how this uh, extended enterprise uh, model exists in, in Singapore and in Bangkok. Here, there is a kind of lead company and this lead company could be a government, the city government, or it could be a, a big corporate uh, like, like uh, Google or IBM. And because most of the smart cities has a technology partner. But these technology partners are the consultants who are turning to be a kind of city planner. But they know that is what is the homogeneous, what is the output they expect. But this output has to be tailor made to these uh, individual cities because each city has the DNA and each city has its own operating modules for the SMEs. So this kind of uh, new solutions has to be provided either by the existing SMEs or by the new startups. This is where we find in, uh, for example, when we, when we analyzed it in the New York city and the uh, Singapore city and most of these new enterprises as a part of the smart initiative comes are either transforming these uh, original SME providers uh, into a kind of uh, uh, reorientation of their services are new startups. The second uh, opportunity exists is coming to this uh, de-risking and uh, particularly access to the finance. Many of you know that is agree with me, access to the finance is a very critical part of the SMEs. This is not happening and the banking sector is not yet ready. And, but this kind of smart initiatives that smart city initiatives provide a kind of, create a kind of uh, new financial capacity for the city governments. For example, they can go into this uh, market and they can generate this uh, type of uh, new financial instruments, like they can issue the green bonds. And so their financial capacity has improved. And also by 
integrating this kind of market that is where there is a full vision exist what is the extent of these uh, markets for sustainability either providing this clean energy or providing the uh, sanitary services are providing the smart transport this opportunity is now it becoming a very kind of opaque or very transparent uh, because of this uh, data and information available previously if you go to these ordinary cities that there there exists some kind of uh, asymmetry there is information is provided with the government and it is not accessible to this uh, smes so uh, with the smart city initiatives this information asymmetry disappears and where this uh, new information are available or it is a kind of new markets. For example, take the case of SDGs. SDGs is a kind of, for, for SMEs, for the business, it is a kind of a market. It is a kind of uh, uh, inventory or the kind of invoice from the future, from the 2030. So this kind of opportunities are new opportunities are available and new financial instruments are made available, but that is more coming as a part of this pandemic recovery packages to make this recovery more green, more green SMEs and new startups are uh, providing the opportunities and the financial guarantees are given. So this is, these are the two new areas uh, that has been not available, but has been coming with the smart city initiatives. Thank you very much, Dr. Ambu. Extremely interesting. I think we could dedicate an entire webinar only to these, and we may do it in the future because what you've just said is so interesting. I saw lots of participants nodding because, uh, uh, again, very interesting categorization about uh, how you know some companies or the public sector can drive this transformation. But because there are so many questions already, let me immediately move again to Korea with Professor Kim. Uh, and Professor Kim, I would like to ask you, uh, you know, going back to your experience, uh, what do you think are the success factors for MSMEs to become, let's say, greener? And what can government do to support this transition? Uh, Professor Kim, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Uh, so when we talk about uh, green transition of uh, companies, I, I think there are two areas. One, first one is the uh, reducing uh, greenhouse gas emission from the management. So from the manufacturing pro process and uh, from the uh, office. So uh, they are pressed, for funds are pressed to reduce the carbon uh, em emission amount. This is one first area of uh, uh, green, green management. And another area is, uh, I think that this is more important and innovative, uh, investing in green industry. Then what, what are green industry? Uh, the, the most uh, uh, popular example is the re renewable energy, uh, solar uh, electricity and uh, like that. And, but uh, these days, the very good examples are uh, electric vehicle, electric vehicle. So yesterday, yesterday was a battery day uh, announced by uh, Tesla, the CEO, Elon Musk. Uh, but you know, uh, out of six most competitive battery companies in the world, three companies are uh, Korean. Uh, other three are from Japan and China. So interestingly, uh, in East Asia, this interest industry is very competitive. So three Korean companies are uh, uh, LG, LG Chemical, and Samsung SDI, and uh, SK Innovation. But uh, what is important is from these companies, we are creating a very good, uh, promising industry ecosystem in battery. So they are producing battery, but and many, many Korean SMEs are working to uh, uh, provide, supply the many kinds of elements and parts to these uh, three companies. So it means many SMEs, many SMEs are investing in uh, green industry. So these are very uh, good uh, examples of what are happening in uh, Korea. And another, another, I want, I want to introduce another Korean experience. 
Uh, so uh, Ambo talked about the smart city. So it, my story is also about digital technology. Digital transformation and digital technology is also very important for the uh, sustainable uh, development. So as I said in the first round, two months ago, uh, Korean government announced the Green New Deal. Uh, but in Green New Deal, there are uh, three areas. First is Green Green New Deal, and second area is Digital New Deal. And third area is uh, uh, Stronger Social Safety Network. So uh, Korea in, in, is, is quite uh, strong in uh, electronic industry and IT area, has uh, strong uh, internet infrastructure. So they want to use this technology to uh, make a uh, green society and a sustainable society. So the digital technology is uh, in, in current society is very uh, valuable tool to make uh, something happen. So uh, even for the uh, uh, greening activities or sustainable uh, activities, we should be able to use uh, digital technology uh, very uh, it, effectively. So uh, uh, from the 10 uh, projects in Green New Deal of Korean government, uh, there one is uh, uh, smart and green city. I, I, told, I, I tell this because uh, Amber talked about the green, uh, smart city. Smart city is very important. So and in many countries, they are trying to build a smart city, a very big huge project. But uh, in Korea, in Green New Deal, one project is uh, smart and green city. So uh, we are pursuing uh, smart, digital, and uh, green, sustainability. These, these two things at, at the uh, same time. So uh, yeah, so uh, l let me finish here. So I try to show some uh, Korean experience. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Also, this uh, collection of Korean experience was extremely relevant and interesting. But uh, it's time for me to stop talking because I saw that uh, so many questions are coming. So I will immediately leave the floor uh, to for TJ for the Q&A. Thanks very much, Julia. Um, yes, in the last few moments, questions have been coming in quite fast and furious. Um, maybe let me just bring bring it back a little bit because you know, it was very interesting to hear from our two entrepreneurs speakers, uh, especially when they talked about, in, in both their cases, the word influence um, was either directly or indirectly mentioned. Um, you know, in the case of Priyanka, it was influence through employee engagement, as well as vendor education. Um, in the case of Avon, um, I, I know for a fact in, in having had a discussion with her prior to this, um, that in her whole process, in terms of even sourcing for the wines, um, there's also a lot of engagement that takes place. So my question to uh, both of you, um, and in interest of time, I'm only gonna give you about one minute plus minus to, to respond. Um, how, how do you see the influence playing a part for small companies in the adoption of sustainability practices from your own experience. Yeah. Um, perhaps I can have Avon share this. So how uh, influence I, play a part? Hmm. Yeah, I'm actually seeing a, a lot actually um, because particularly those that are starting businesses now um, and the conversation revolve uh, by the brand owners is that it is a given. There is no other way to do it, but it's a given. It's not even mm -hmm. a choice anymore. Uh, and it's a very deliberate effort to, uh, apart from a, a bigger picture, but to as small as their packaging. So like in our case, uh, we are part of this um, circular packaging uh, initiative where all our packaging are uh, being shared amongst the various brand owners because there's some wastage in your business like it or not that you cannot repurpose 
So like in our case, they're wine, wine carton boxes. And just today, they got picked up by a secondhand book company where those wine carton boxes are going to be used to host the books, the secondhand books that consumers purchase online because they're very durable and, you know, it fits. So, yeah, and, and, and but I think, you know, for, for me to end on that note is that it shouldn't be just because. So it shouldn't be a marketing gimmick. I think there has to be a very purposeful, very genuine why uh, a business wants to be uh, influential in the area of sustainability. Thanks very much, Avon. Um, Priyanka, are you able to hear me at the moment? Because I think you had some issues. Okay, if not, um, I want to pick up on something that um, Avon talked about. And that is the, the, also something that Dr. Anbu shared in terms of the whole um, circular economy. Because both of you touched something about you know, what is potentially waste from one company becoming a new product for another company. Um, if, if I may ask both perhaps Dr. Anbu and um, Professor Kim, in your opinion, from a point of perhaps the regional perspective and maybe in country, um, how has the, because traditionally it has been government-led initiatives. Mm -hmm. Do you see business-led initiatives, particularly from SMEs, beginning to come up mm -hmm. as far as promoting this whole circular economy concept. Yeah. So mm, do you I see a, a change in this? Um, Dr. Anbu and Professor Kim, if, yeah. if I could um, just give you a one minute restriction first. <laughs> sure, and, and uh, I think um, when, when coming to this um, issue of the sustainability, I think uh, the whole lot of uh, responsibility lies with the business and the business because they are the creator of the problem and and uh, and also the solution also has to come from them and so i think without business and nothing is going to happen and uh, the governments are ineffective because they have the policy changes uh, and but uh, and the consumer is ignorant of the issues so here that the, how how the business and uh, Encourage the governments to provide the incentives, and uh, encourage the consumers to create the, the demand for the mm. sustainability, the market demand. Mm. So this has to go with this. And and uh, here I found there are there are two things. And uh, one is the uh, greening greening the industries, greening the SMEs, and that could focus on this uh, resource efficiency. Where that is the business gain. It, it is it is going with this. Uh, um, bottom of the line that is improving the profit that that, that should be there and that, that, that this rationale should be there. So this resource efficiency, energy efficiency, greening into this uh, SMEs will bring that one that has to be supported by the government with the incentives. The so second one is that is the more green industries. That is what what Kim mentioned about it. And uh, here we need to see that is the, so far this uh, business model, that is we has a kind of alternate business model. While the mainstream business is more green and it is about 80%, 90%. So how this uh, new business model, this alternate business model become the mainstream business model? That, that 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 need to see it and the, the market is doesn't work the government is ignorant of it and uh, so here we need to be innovative find that is working the policy instruments so that is uh, more uh, this uh, green uh, industry is becoming the new normal and here this is the stimulus packages provide us a, a kind of opportunity to transform it whether okay. we use it or we place it or we miss it it is the responsibility of us then we will be blamed for future Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Anbu. Uh, Professor Kim, sir. Yeah, yes, uh, I will answer uh, very briefly. So, uh, at least in Korea, as I told, the uh, role of SMEs will uh, be incre increasing. So, um, I actually, I, I, I don't know any specific example that SMEs. Uh, uh, try to make uh, a, a real effort 
about uh, sustainability or uh, green green business. But uh, so the, in Korea, the role of SMEs and uh, capability of SMEs are increasing. So uh, they will uh, have uh, in the future. We will have uh, some good uh, example. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, sir. If you don't mind, TJ, I just wanted to echo what uh, you know, uh, uh, Dr. Anbu said. Right, I, I think that it, he made very good points, and that the takeaway that I have from that is that I think, as business owner, you wear the head of a change maker because mm. you're so capable. It's control is in your hand, and you're very capable to influence and to get you know education out there. So uh, I think that was actually uh, you know nicely expressed. Yeah, that's great. Thanks very much for adding. Um, Priyanka, if you can hear me. Yes, TJ, yeah. I can hear you now. Awesome. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, you know, please feel free to share your thoughts in the next one to two minutes. Uh, so I was yeah. talking about, you know, influence, because in your case, you shared quite a bit in terms of employee engagement. Yeah. Um, and then also with vendor education. So for, for SMEs who are looking to really, you know, look into sustainability, um, how do you see influence playing a part? And what, what type of um, perhaps tips and advice would you be able to give? Um, I think uh, the most important thing is that you need to believe what you are doing. Like we believe in Grosadel that we will focus on zero usage of plastic during our delivery. We would not say that it was a cakewalk for us. It was as easy. Definitely it was difficult. But when we started engaging the other people, our team members, the consumer who are buying, the vendors, when we asked them not to deliver on plastic, I think that is where the impact is made. When, we, when you are not only the person who is doing it, but also you are influencing the person who is related or co-related to your work. For example, my delivery drivers, when he comes back to me and talk to me, he says that, yes, I did not use 100 plastic bags towards my delivery end of the day. The person who is packing the products, he gets satisfied. Yes, I packed the product, but I did not use plastic. The consumer, they are satisfied. Yes, I received the products from Grosadel. I opened it, I returned their bags, and I did not use plastic. So when we receive products from different vendors, we ask them not to use plastic or to say to use minimalistic plastic when some vendor have to use it because of food safety guidelines. So this is how it's an ecosystem which we are building. It's a supply chain, I think, which we are building up and we are trying to do a bit from our end and we are expecting the same thing from other end also. Okay, thank you so much, Priyanka. Um, really, I think to, to echo a few, few of the comments made, um, as the businesses, the business owners are the change makers. They are the influencers, the ones that can, um, I guess it's up in our hands to see how best we can engage with our customers, with our vendors, as well as with the government. Um, and with, with that as a wrap up, maybe in the remaining minutes, um, if, if I could invite again, both uh, Dr. Anbu and uh, Professor Kim, because there was a question that was asking about, you know, what, what, which emerging business sectors um, do you see having a potential, you know, in terms of the whole um, sustainability part of things? Um, I know you alluded to a few of them, but, you know, if I could, if I could have your thoughts once again, uh, for the benefit of our, our participants, um, Perhaps um, I, if I may start with uh, Professor Kim, you know, just just a few short short points in terms of uh, where where do you see you know uh, potential business sectors? Yeah, 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 yeah. So um, in, in my answering second rounds, uh, in green business, uh, there are two areas. One area is uh, reducing carbon emission amount. So in, in this point, I want to mention steel, steel industry. 
So, do you know, POSCO, POSCO is the very uh, famous uh, steel company from Korea. So it is a very uh, carbon in the intensive industry. So they are pressed so much to reduce the carbon emission amount. So uh, they need a new technology and also they have to invest a huge fund to, uh, for this new process, green process and technology. So uh, I, for, for First, I want to mention steel industry. And the second area of uh, uh, green management is uh, entering green industry. Then what I, green industry, the most, most important one currently is uh, electric, electronic vehicle, huh? Tesla or, and all global auto companies are uh, entering this area. So. In Korea, it, it's booming. It's booming. Mm. So, all regional governments said we will we will build electronic vehicle plant and uh, industry uh, park like that. So it's it's booming. So, uh, and electronic vehicle and also the battery for uh, for that uh, vehicle is a, okay. uh, a key. Uh, uh, industry for the uh, uh, green future. Thank you very much, Professor Kim. Um, Anbu, Dr. Anbu, uh, the last minute is yours. <laughs> okay, you give one minute, but it is like the, the question itself <laughs> is a very complex and it has the no no single answer. But but uh, the key is uh, that is the, the momentum and towards the sustainability is already here in this region and is it is initiated by the business and we need to be thankful to them. But how to transform this momentum uh, from the momentum to these uh, transformative actions? That is where that is the more trust is needed. And uh, here I find uh, basically I, I, I am going back to this my my uh, original statement, the first statement. This uh, this characteristics of the SMEs. Uh, so this uh, this ASEAN countries basically they are the export oriented uh, economies and where I think uh, here this is uh, looking into this SMEs in the global value chain, how their environmental performance could be improved and what are the sustainability opportunities that could be the first priority and the second priority is that is the SMEs uh, that is working in the cluster that is as we say this uh, application of the low carbon economy model or the circular economy model with a target setting i think that could be the uh, way that is we need to look into it where that is the already there are several clusters has been transformed into eco friendly zones and the third and more uh, interesting or more challenging is this uh, small micro enterprises that is very much ingrained into this social fabric of the communities. And here we need to be careful and each community has its own DNA. And this DNA has to be identified. The social capital has to be enhanced to find a common and sustainable solutions. I think this is a kind of a differentiated approach for the MS SME should be there. And knowing that is still a lot has to be done. Mm. Thank you so much, sir. So um, before I hand the floor back to Julia, really for the businesses that are out there, um, it is really one size does not fit all. You have to see, you know, yeah, in your own country, in your own sector, what are the opportunities? Um, and I think over the course of the last few sessions, uh, as business owners, we really have to be adaptive resilient, even as we continue to be the change makers and the influences. Yeah, so that you know, we, we play a part in the whole link between government, the public, the private, and the people sectors. Yeah. So you know, um, we, we just have to continue to do that, um, continue to find opportunities to engage. So thank you, um, everyone. Thank you to speakers, um, and also for those that have posed questions. Um, I, I do apologize, we can't answer all the questions, um, but we, we try our best. So back to you, Julia. Thank you very much, TJ. I think we had a very rich uh, discussion. Uh, so uh, it was very interesting. I took uh, lots of notes during uh, the webinar. 
uh, it's time to conclude. So I would just to, like to thank once again our four speakers, Professor Kim, Dr. Ambu, our two entrepreneurs, uh, CEO and founders, Ms. Ivona and Ms. Bianca. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you to all participants for such a dynamic conversation also through the chat box. And uh, uh, let me tell you that in exactly two weeks time, we will be back with the six episodes of the series where we will discuss MSMEs and skills and the future of work. And we hope to have you back uh, in two weeks time. So see you soon. And thanks again for participating. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you.